Welcome to this inquiry into private equity, which is very topical. He's manhandled the buyout industry's masters of the universe. Matt Ridley, I'm chairman of Northern Rock. Savaged the directors of Northern Rock. Are you your own man? And even more, the usually unflappable Mervyn King. He is a man unafraid of tackling hard issues head on and the driving force behind the regeneration of his hometown. Hello, I'm Elliot Gotkin. Welcome to For the Record and welcome to London's Houses of Parliament, where for the past 21 years, John McFall has plied his trade as a Labour MP. During that time, he's been an Under Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and Lord Commissioner for the Cabinet Office. But it's his role as the Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee that this 64-year-old Scot has been making a name for himself. In particular, it was the investigations he led into the private equity industry and the first run on a British bank in more than a century that vaulted McFall into the limelight. His final report on Northern Rock, published in January, criticised its directors, the Financial Services Authority and the Bank of England. Um, can I thank the, my right honourable friend and his colleagues on the Treasury Select, Select Committee? And then three weeks later, this happened. The government has decided to introduce legislation to take Northern Rock into a period of temporary public ownership. McFall says most of the blame lies with the bank's bosses. Well, in terms of Northern Rock, it's the Northern Rock board itself. They are responsible for their own demise. It was a reckless business model, has been mentioned to us by witnesses to the committee and the board should have seen that, the non-executive directors, and we single out the non-exec directors, the chairman of the audit committee and the senior non-executive director for not asking appropriate questions. For example, in the first half of 2007, Northern Rock was responsible for about 19% of all new mortgage lending. Now, that's a company that's doing exceedingly well. I would have imagined the chairman of the audit commission, the risk committee, to have asked the chief executive why they were doing so well. Basic questions, and I don't think these were addressed. So Northern Rock are responsible themselves. There was also a failure of regulation, and we're very clear in a report that the FSA are responsible for that. And then when Northern Rock went to the tripartite authority, uh, there was not a ready response there. So the tripartite authority relationship has to be looked at and that's what we focused on in our report and indeed we came up with a suggestion that in order to introduce a bit of grit into the system we need a post of Deputy Governor of the Bank of England which has responsibility for financial stability and that post holder would we envisage be one of the principal advisors to the Chancellor of the Exchequer on financial stability. OK, now we've seen heads rolling from Northern Rock, but we haven't seen anyone either at the Financial Services Authority or at the Bank of England, which also came in for criticism in your report. We haven't seen anyone uh, fall on their sword. Do you think that someone perhaps at the FSA, which you've criticised so pointedly, should be, uh, should be stepping down? Well, I think it's quite right that we saw heads rolling in Northern Rock. After all, it was the Chairman and Chief Executive in particular who were responsible for the stewardship of that company, so they had to go. But what our committee was looking at was a way forward for the future. We could have engaged in scapegoating and perhaps we would have got a number of exciting or lurid headlines for a day or two, but that wasn't the aim of it. You have an obligation. During the Treasury Select Committee hearings, McFall twice faced off with the Governor of the Bank of England. And although he doesn't blame Mervyn King for Northern Rock's fate, he says the central bank was found wanting when it came to bailing out the lender. What happened when Northern Rock came to the Tripartite Authority and when the Bank of England in particular was that it was announced that the Bank of England was acting as a lender of last resort. I've compared that to a company being on its financial deathbed and the Bank of England are saying, yes, we are going to be your lender of last resort. The communication strategy should have ensured that a positive response was made and the message going out should have been that this company has come to us. It's a company that's viable, it's solvent, as the FSA said it was. It has a good order book and therefore we are assisting that company. But that message was not put across. Uh, you said that Northern Rock's business model was reckless in the amount that it was borrowing or relied on the money mm. markets for its borrowings. Do you think there should be some sort of cap of the amount of money that, that banks, as a proportion of their lending, if you like, 
Should there be a cap on the amount that they can borrow? And, and if so, what, what kind of cap would well, you Well, there is a cap at? at the moment with building societies in terms of the level of retail deposits that they should have. And it's ironic to think that if Northern Rock had remained a building society, it wouldn't have got itself into this trouble. But all the authorities, and I'm talking globally here, failed to monitor the issue of liquidity. And now that they are attempting that after the horse has bolted uh, and the stable door has been locked. Uh, I think it's important that that issue is looked at. The FSA are presently undertaking that and uh, we await developments in that area. Okay, and just, just finally on Northern Rock, you had everyone from the Bank of England governor to uh, investment bankers uh, to the Financial Services Authority appearing uh, before your panel. Who's to, who, who to you were, were the most impressive or the, or the least impressive witnesses that, when they came before you? Well, I, I was a former school teacher and if I had to mark this as an essay, then I would mark them all down. But I'm looking forward and the message I would have at the bottom of the report card would be, could do better and I sincerely hope that that happens and they will have active support from me as headmaster to ensure that they do better. The Treasury Select Committee's remit is to examine the policies, the administration and the money spent by the Treasury and related bodies, like the Bank of England. But it's pretty much free to choose the subjects of its investigations. So when the private equity boom was at its peak last year, culminating in the £11 billion purchase of Alliance Boots, the Treasury Select Committee decided to take a closer look at the buyout industry. Has it not been explained up to date, you think, Mr Yeah. I think Well, private equity burst upon the stage in the United Kingdom last year, particularly with the bids for Boots and uh, the one for the supermarket. Sainsbury's and those who are participating in private equity and I've met a lot of people who work in private equity they say they never realised that barrier that they were going through what consequences it would have it made them very much public figures to the extent that when the select committee announced that we were going to have an inquiry the industry itself asked Sir David Walker to look at private equity and provide his recommendations. So it was that very act of us holding that inquiry that pushed private equity into looking at this situation. So Sir David Walker did carry out this review of the um, private equity uh, industry on, on behalf of the industry itself, yet he himself came in for rather savage uh, criticism when he appeared before your panel. Uh, when it pretty much transpired that the biggest punishment to a private equity firm that doesn't adhere to its own industry-led guidelines is being kicked out of it, but yet there's already private equity firms who just choose not to be members of it for whatever their reasons are. So were you a bit disappointed with Sir David Walker's uh, review and his testimony? Well, that's a paradox, because what that implies is that the private equity industry will sanction a company for not adhering to their guidelines, and that sanction will mean they're out with the guidelines and they can do what they want. So that isn't a good situation, and I think they'll have to find a way around that. And they have appointed Sir Mike Rake uh, with a committee to look at the way forward for private equity, and I would hope that that's one of the top items on their agenda. What would you like to have seen the Walker Review come up with? What recommendations would you now be advocating? Well, in terms of Mike Rake and his colleagues on the committee, one of the big issues there is to engage with stakeholders and the rest of the community. That means engaging with uh, the workers and trade unions and others so that they can come to a good agreement. We have perfectly good arrangements in the PLC world for employee-employer relations, and I would like to see those replicated in the private equity industry. So that engagement issue is very important. And one recommendation I would make is that in Sir Mike Rake's committee, there, there should be one trade unionist so that they get a wider view. And there perhaps should be some investors from the investor community to get that wider view. They need to become wider because Sir David Walker said to us that private equity was private to the extent of secrecy. Well, that has got to go. How much tax should private equity firms and their partners pay? Well, I'm not here to give an absolute level of what taxes should pay, but what I am keen to do is to ensure there's fairness 
in the taxation system. And evidence we received from practitioners in the private equity industry indicated that a number of people in private equity pay less tax than their cleaners. And that was mentioned from within the private equity industry has been unfair. I agree with that wholly. And that's why we should be looking at the issue of, say, for example, disclosure of executive pay. Because these private equity companies now have got stakes in the British economy that are very crucial stakes. Uh, we're not here to damn the private equity industry. We're here to support it. But in supporting it, it has to act on a level playing field. And we have to ensure that there is transparency and there is fairness, particularly in the taxation system. Thank you. Well, Chancellor Alistair Darling already, um, as a result of the furore over the amount of tax they were paying, first of all increased it to, to a flat rate of 18% on capital gains tax and then uh, backtracked somewhat to, to set a threshold of a million pounds. Uh, what did you make of the Chancellor's U-turn there? Was, was it a good thing for him to do? Well, I thought it was a bit hasty to begin with. And indeed, I mentioned to the Chancellor in the House of Commons debate when he made that statement that he should be looking at the issue of management fees in the private equity industry because this is an area where a lot of monies are being made and the taxation is almost non-existent there. I don't say that, but I say that from the point of view of insiders in the industry telling me that. So I've asked the Chancellor to look at that. So you're asking me, is there a distance to go yet in this debate? There certainly is. And the Treasury Committee has to date published an interim report and we will come back to this issue uh, during 2008. And do the um, masters of the universe, as you describe them, the, the leading lights of the private equity industry, do they get a could do better on their report card as well? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think the masters of the universe have blinked once or twice. You know, I want them to blink more regularly. Welcome back. John McFall is the undisputed king of the castle when it comes to the Treasury Select Committee, but it's here in Dumbarton that it all began. This is where he grew up. This is where he taught at a nearby school. And this is where, at the last election, he won more than half the vote. Yet McFall, seen here at the opening of a local art exhibition, is something of an accidental politician. He says he was more than happy teaching, but after steadying the local Labour Party following a bout of infighting, he says his friends encouraged him to stand for Parliament. After chewing it over, he decided to go for it, much to the surprise of his wife. Well, my wife felt Parliament was a hot house atmosphere and hot air atmosphere and in teaching she's a teacher and I'm a teacher uh, you're able to do things for young people and feel some achievement at the end of the day whereas you're standing up in Parliament you're saying something do you achieve anything out of that and given that I've been in teaching for many years enjoyed it I had a wide circle of friends and there was a lot of fraternity in teaching she felt it would have been best if I had stayed in teaching however I saw an opportunity there and I decided to go for Parliament. But if we get this right, then this is, this is good. Away from Westminster and the Treasury Committee, McFall keeps busy by spearheading a £75 million regeneration project in his constituency. Since the last ship built here sailed out of the docks in 1964, the area has struggled, and McFall, who left school with no qualifications but now has three degrees, says he identifies closely with the less fortunate voters in his hometown and in society as a whole. Well, if you look at my constituency, it was formerly a heavy engineering shipbuilding constituency, and it's now changed and there's a transformation, and there is still quite a relative high degree of poverty and uh, one has to be reminded of that at all times and as chairman of the treasury committee i'm not just dealing with microeconomic issues important that those may be but issues which affect ordinary people and do you see it as perhaps a springboard to perhaps a cabinet post uh, once your term is finished no i think I, I just take things in westminster as they come you know one door closes one door open you've got to be very pragmatic in politics. This has been a big door opening for me in the Treasury Committee and I want to savour that. The, job, ah, right. the Treasury Committee and the regeneration of his constituency take up a good deal of McFall's time. He no longer runs marathons but he says he does what he can to stay trim. Well now I would like to say that uh, in Terry Wogan's words I'm fighting the flab you know I'm not doing anything <laughs> heroic in that but to keep yourself ticking over physically I think is very important because it keeps you mentally alert as well.
Okay, now you're also chairman of the Scotch Whiskey and Spirits Group uh, of Parliament. Uh, do you like a, a, a tipple of the local, um, a local distilled uh, brew, or, or are you uh, part of the abstemious uh, bunch of uh, Labour MPs uh, to which Gordon Brown adheres? Oh, no, no, I'm not abstemious, you know, and I think uh, we've got to enjoy ourselves in life, you know, it's no use going through life uh, mournful. Uh, so I don't have that point of view, and I do enjoy my tipple and my uh, cupboards in the house. My home is filled with quite a number of good malts. During your two decades or so in Parliament, you've held a variety of positions. But what for you is your, your greatest achievement as a politician? Well, when I went into Parliament at first, I was naive enough to think that I only wanted to change the big things in life. And I realised that the most important things to change in life are the small things. So, for example, in my constituency, the Strathleven Regeneration Area, the Clyde Bank rebuilt, which I'm chairman of, this is an economic development project that is going the whole way through my constituency, running through the constituency. And at the end of the day, we could be talking about extra prosperity and jobs for this area. So those are important issues for me. But in Parliament, as Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, I'm proud of the fact that what we've done recently is that we've established 600 free ATM machines in low-income areas throughout the United Kingdom with the cooperation of the financial services community. That means that over £4 million uh, per week has been saved by people. And for poorer people, you're talking about £7 a week been saved if they go to the ATM machine three or four times a week, which is the government's recommendation for those in low income. So that is very good. But in terms of the banks and credit cards and transparency issues, that is a big issue as well. I like to think I build a bridge between Parliament and the general public. But McFall hasn't always built bridges with his witnesses. The Vice President of the British Private Equity and Venture Capital Association says he was made to feel like a sex offender when he went before the committee. I am extremely keen to try and turn... The former chairman of Northern Rock appeared close to tears, but McFall says he's just doing his job. First of all, do I apologise for having a critical analysis? The answer is no. In that critical analysis, do we break some heads at times? Perhaps. But we've got a good medical team on the sidelines and we can patch them up. But the real issue here is that we have that critical analysis and then we go on to focus on the policy outcomes and the positive policy outcomes. If you look at the Northern Rock report we've had, it's the only substantial report that has been undertaken in Northern Rock. It's been welcomed by the Chancellor, welcomed by the Treasury, indeed welcomed by the industry as such. And it is feeding in to the consultation exercise over the next three months. So already we're having a positive effect as a committee. Do you ever, in your, what you describe as your critical analysis, do you ever worry that you, you go too far? I mean, for example, your, um, your questioning of uh, Peter Linthwaite, the CEO of the British Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, was, was um, so uh, severe that he, he resigned just a couple of days later. Well, again, the British Venture Capital Association, some of them come up to me afterwards to apologise uh, for their inept performance. So if people are coming before the committee, they've got to be prepared. And we ask simple questions in the committee, and they've... To, got to be prepared to answer those questions and to be honest with us. Uh, have they been provided with sharp questions? Yeah, uh, but that's, that's in the nature of it. And I would be letting myself down and letting Parliament down if we had people before us and all we did was sit and have a cup of tea and ask them whether they were going on their holidays. A lot of concerns about the global economy and about mm -hmm. the UK economy. Uh, is Britain prepared for a downturn? Well, we have our financial stability and transparency report coming out as part two of Northern Rock and one of the issues in that will be how we ensure that this global world has got some common rules and how we engage with other countries and other financial centres. So that report hopefully will be out shortly. Yeah, well we've talked about private equity, we've talked about financial stability and transparency. Who's up next for uh, their time in the spotlight uh, before the Treasury Select Committee? Well, we have the private equity report to go back to, and we'll probably be going back to that in May. And given the state of the world economy at the moment, the budget proposals that are being produced by the Chancellor will be very interesting indeed. And I think that the committee 
will give the Chancellor a very positive and warm welcome when he comes along in May. Just finally, do you ever find your work on the committee is hindered by either the government or partisanship on the part of uh, your colleagues on the committee? Well, I live in the political world and I realise uh, what the constraints are in the political world. I've been here for 21 years and I've negotiated my way around this reasonably successfully, despite the roadblocks that get put in your way at different times, and I look forward to continuing that. So it's been a year in which the Treasury Select Committee has made headlines for the way it's tackled private equity gurus, the heads of financial institutions and the directors of Northern Rock. But with reports due this year on the budget, financial stability and inherited estates, 2008 looks set to be another busy year for John McFall. That's it for this week's edition of For The Record. Thanks for watching.